You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Welcome to Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Masamela Odo. And I'm Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. With the emergence of the highly contagious COVID-19 Omicron variant, the world is witnessing the most significant surge in new COVID-19 cases in a year. On November 24, 2021, scientists in South Africa reported the presence of the Omicron variant to the World Health Organization. The COVID-19 Omicron variant multiplies 70 times faster than the Delta variant, which had already multiplied exponentially faster than the Alpha variant, the first version of COVID-19. It is important to note that the Omicron variant was first identified by scientists in South Africa because the emergence of the Omicron variant has become an excuse to limit travel and closely surveil the movement of migrants and travelers from Southern Africa and parts of Central and East Africa. Samaya Kalia, associate editor at The Swaddle, makes this crucial point in a December 2nd, 2021 article. Kalia notes, of the 14 countries that had early confirmed cases of the Omicron, only two, I repeat, only two of the countries were in Africa, South Africa and Botswana. 10 of the 14 countries with early cases were in Europe. Nevertheless, all of the 10 countries with travel bans were in Africa. The Washington Post reported that Omicron was in the Netherlands before the scientists in South Africa reported the presence of the variant. These contributions highlight the reasons Chairman Amali Chatella has dubbed COVID-19 the colonial virus. Its origins notwithstanding, like all colonial capitalist contradictions, the Omicron variant has hit African people the hardest. The statistics suggest that Omicron, though very contagious, is far less deadly than early COVID-19 variants. Studies have shown that vaccination drastically reduces the chances of hospitalization. Some analysts believe that Omicron indicates a waning of the COVID-19 pandemic. That is yet to be seen. In the meantime, we know that Africans are still being hit harder in many cases by the virus than white people. The numbers are still being compiled, but places such as the Washington, D.C. area have reported that half the new cases and 77 percent of the recent COVID-19 deaths have been Africans. I personally know three people who have died from COVID-19 since December. This pandemic may be waning, but it seems to be long from over. Two years ago, in January and February 2020, at the dawn of the pandemic, the African People's Socialist Party was one of the few organizations to take the pandemic seriously, even before the U.S. surge hit in late February and March. While some people were saying that Africans cannot get the disease, and others attributed the disease to the construction of 5G cellular towers, it was at the first plenary of the African People's Socialist Party's seventh Congress that was held February 1st to February 3rd, 2020 that Louise Kinshasa issued a crucial report on the potential impact of COVID-19 on African people if it was not taken seriously. The African People's Socialist Party, by way of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Projects, Project Black Ankh, went into immediate action leading the African fight against COVID-19. 
On today's episode of Black Power Talks, we have Dr. Aisha Fields. Dr. Fields is a physicist who has dedicated her skills for the development and empowerment of African people. She is the international director of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, ABDEP, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to collectivize the vast skills of Africans around the world in order to establish community-based development projects that improve the quality of life for African people everywhere while promoting self-reliance and self-determination as key to genuine sustainable development. Dr. Fields recently led a team of ABDEP officials to Cuba, where they visited the Latin American School of Medicine, ELAM, and learned about Cuba's progressive fight against COVID-19, which dwarfs the U.S. ABDEP has organized renewable energy, water purification, farming, healthcare and ecological sanitation projects in West and Southern Africa, and community gardens in Washington, D.C., Houston, Texas, and Huntsville, Alabama. ABDEP's Project Black Onk is a worldwide African emergency response organization. Since March 2020, Project Black Onk has mobilized volunteers to conduct health education and community support efforts to combat COVID-19. Project Black Onk was initiated during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone and was employed to assist Africans trapped in floodwaters in Houston during Hurricane Harvey, where emergency aid was denied to the Black community. Who are Dr. Fields? Welcome back to the show. Uhuru, Dr. Matsumela, Uhuru, Comrade Dexter, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to have you back. Now, I know the data is still changing and it's not all out there, but can you tell us what you know about the Omicron variant and what has Project Black Ankh been saying about it? Well, um, throughout this uh, pandemic, APDEP has been really trying to stay on top of what, where we are in various phases of the pandemic and um, developing and um, revamping our uh, COVID-19 protocols that we've developed for our movement and for the African community at large uh, where necessary and giving updates um, that we, you know, think give some guidance, some understanding uh, from a trusted source, you know, um, around where we are. There's so much information that is out there. Some of it is uh, blatantly false. Some of it is um, confusing. You know, some, some of it is a bit, is spoken a bit maybe um, over the heads of the average person. And so we've, we've really worked to try to make periodic updates um, that give our people an understanding of, you know, where things are and how we should move. And in our most recent update, we discussed, as you mentioned, um, where things are now in terms of uh, the Omicron variant being the dominant variant now um, around the world. And what we understand is that this variant um, has come on the heels of what had been the most deadly variant to date, the Delta variant, which was a really, um, really scary period. The, the Delta variant came um, right after there had been um, uh, uh, vaccines developed for, uh, for COVID-19 that seemed to be uh, working relatively well. And even though Delta was very... Um, transmissible and also very pathogenic, which means that it, it caused much more severe illness than previous variants. There still seemed to be protection that people uh, had from the vaccines if they had been vaccinated that gave us a sense of thinking that maybe vaccines were really the way out of this pandemic and that if there could be more access to vaccines around the world, that that could just signal the end of, of this pandemic. In comes Omicron, a much, much more transmissible variant than even Delta. And it was very frightening to know that there was something that was on the scene that was seem to be something that if you were in the realm of it, if you were near it, that you were going to catch it. You know, there wasn't a lot of time that you could 
be in the presence of someone who had Omicron without getting it yourself. And uh, what we have come to, I think, uh, learn from data from South Africa and from other parts of the world now is that um, while Omicron is extremely transmissible, it doesn't appear to be as pathogenic, as um, as uh, uh, harmful uh, to to people who catch it. There isn't as much likelihood that someone would uh, be hospitalized, for example, or to die from Omicron variant as compared to previous variants, the Delta and the original and other variants that have preceded uh, Delta and Omicron. So um, that's not to say, though, that it's not something to take seriously because the sheer, you know, transmissibility of Omicron has made it so that huge numbers of people around the world have uh, have gotten Omicron. And, you know, part of the, the problem that many countries face as it relates to the COVID pandemic is that is is how the healthcare systems may be able to respond to the needs that people have, you know, who have complications from COVID. So uh, the fact that so many people, you know, have gotten Omicron is an indication of how many people could potentially then, you know, require hospitalization or may even die. So again, while it is, it's helpful to, to know that this is, you know, less likely to cause severe illness or death, that there's still the potential to do incredible harm to individuals and to communities. We also know that the Omicron variant is very resistant to at least the the Pfizer and Moderna and other vaccines that are have been widely available in the United States and Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, and that even with the booster campaign that has been initiated in the U.S. and in Europe and um, and in Israel, uh, where in the U.S. and Europe at least their third doses that have been given in places like Israel, there are even fourth doses that have been given. Despite that, you know, Omicron is still something that people can get even with having gotten those booster shots. Now, what we, what seems to be the case is that if you do have a booster, uh, while you can get the Omicron variant, it's less likely if you have a booster or if you just have the two doses of, a, of the, of either, uh, MRNA vaccine that you, um, are protected against severe disease. So what's that mean? That means that Omicron is out there. Almost everyone in almost every part of the world is likely to be exposed to this virus. If you haven't already in the very near future, and, you know, we should be aware of that. Um, and, know that, uh, you know, that there are some things still that we can do to minimize um, our risk of having complications associated with that. We can uh, do things like make sure to still wear our masks, you know, when we are in public places. Uh, and in this instance with Omicron, the type of mask that we wear is important. Uh, studies have shown recently that cloth masks do relatively little to protect us from um, from you know uh, being infected with COVID nineteen, so cloth masks are not appropriate um, at you know at this time. And uh, the better options, obviously, are surgical masks, and then uh, better than that are the KN ninety five or N ninety five masks. So when going out in public, we should definitely continue to wear masks. And uh, where possible, you know, uh, we should go for the KN95 or N95 masks. Uh, we should also continue to uh, do the things that will help us to improve our immune systems. We should get adequate rest uh, we, and sleep. We should get uh, plenty of water. We, we should do things uh, that help also like, you know, regular exercise. Uh, there are some things like vitamin C and zinc that could be, and vitamin D that could be added to our daily vitamin, uh, our daily regimen, um, if, if, you know, if, if appropriate and, um, yeah. And I think those are things that we should, you know, continue to do, uh, in this period of, of Omicron. Luru, 
Ooh, Dr. Aisha, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for that answer. And I just really can't emphasize enough um, just how much I appreciate just the extent of the work that App Devon Project Black Onk has done around this virus and, and, and just given the masses of our people leadership around this. So I really want to appreciate that. You know, from day one, epidemiologists had stated that the pandemic would last at least two years. Some people have suggested that the particularities of Omicron suggest that the disease will be on its way out. What do you think about that, Dr. Aisha? Um, I think it's I think it's it's possible. And the reason why I say that is um, some recent studies um, have shown that um, while having a previous infection with COVID-19 or having been vaccinated or boosted doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get Omicron. What they are indicating is that if you do become infected with Omicron, that you do have immunity against other variants. So that's to say that for those people who do wind up being infected with this Omicron variant, uh, they'll have a a degree uh, of protection against uh, other circulating variants that may be around right now and potentially future variants um, that might come after Omicron. So there is a sense of possibility or hope that uh, this, you know, that the large numbers of people around the world who, because of how transmissible this um, virus is that will get this and recover and have some level of immunity will mean that pretty soon, not that the virus will go away, not that COVID-19 will be something that we could eliminate, but that it something that could exist, um, you know, in, in various populations um, in a, in a way that um, we can, uh, predict how it will how it will uh, uh, function. So it would be what we call endemic. So not that it wouldn't exist, but that we could predict. Okay, this is a season where we can expect, you know, higher levels of COVID nineteen because of certain factors, just like we do with the flu or with other coronaviruses like the common cold. So um, there is a sense that this could be you know, something that signals an end, at least to this phase of what we've come to know as the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but that's still yet to be seen. However, it is something I think that more and more uh, scientists uh, are beginning to predict. Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks for that, Dr. Fields. You know, I have always said that I really, really appreciate the protocols and the leadership of ABDEP and Project Black Onk. I have no doubt that it likely has saved my life and the lives of others in my family, my community, as well as colleagues at work. Even amidst the colonial capitalist haste to reopen society to devastating effects, the Project Black Unk protocols have not wavered. Uh, I've been forced back into the classroom, actually, by colleges that I work for, but adherence to our protocols has protected myself and undoubtedly my students. So, I have personally witnessed uh, your fierce struggle for these protocols, even making a very hard decision as your public position on the vaccine. Why has it been so important for you to take this stance? Well, Huru, I think, um, first of all, I want to appreciate um, your sharing, you know, your experience with the protocols. And I think Part of what our responsibility is uh, in the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, probably our primary responsibility um, is to make sure that the skills that we have in, in the African nation are used for the African nation, are used to advance the interests of the African nation. Um, as opposed to the interests of individuals or as opposed to advancing the interests of the colonizer and the colonizer nation, which is typically how, especially certain kind of skills that Africans have accumulated in this most recent period have gone. They've gone 
to, yeah, to making sure that there's a continued ability for the colonizer to, to, you know, to dominate, uh, not only African people, but to dominate the world. And so ABDEP's responsibility under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party is to collectivize the skills, to call those skills home and to for Africans to recognize um, and take the responsibility that we have to the African nation. And I'm saying that because um, I'm saying that because uh, there's there's so much, especially as it relates to um, this COVID-19 colonial virus that has been confusing um, for African people. That's put us in so many ways. And I think I wrote about it in one issue of the Burning Spear newspaper that has put us in like between a rock and a hard place. And the thing is that as African people and the chairman, our chairman Amalia Shetela has spoken of this. um, I've heard him speak about this many times when talking about the COVID-19 vaccine is that it's it's rational for African people to reject, you know, something of uh, to, to reject something from the colonizer that's supposed to be given to us to help us when the relationship that we've had has not ever been one where we've been given anything freely to help, but that when we have had a relationship of abuse, so it's rational for Africans to to question or to even outright reject the COVID-19 vaccine, especially in a period of crisis. It's an unknown, new, you know, novel virus. People are, you know, getting sick and, you know, hospitals are confused about how to handle it. We've already had this incredibly, you know, um, you know, like bad relationship to the colonial medical establishment and medical professionals, generally speaking. And, um, you know, and so to then be in a position to feel as if um, we have to, or we're being pushed to take some vaccine that we don't understand, developed by people who we don't trust, you know, pushed by a government that has never done anything but um but uh, abuse us um take from us you know uh uh you know and and then to be told that th- that this is something that we have to do and that this is uh that we you know and that we're crazy not to no it's crazy to not question that at the same time there are political and and scientific, you know, kinds of, um, considerations that we have to be able to make, to make sure that we're making choices or decisions that really are in our best interest. So it makes sense to have almost a knee jerk reaction, but, you know, but there's always a need to really sum up. And I think that's one of the things that, after um, our project Black on Medical Advisory Team was was tasked to be able to do is to really look at the look at the science, you know, look at what uh, we understood about the nature of the vaccines that were developed, um, you know, and whether or not we thought that despite our initial, you know, obvious concerns about what you know, whether or not we should recommend the vaccine to African people to really look at it and make a determination based on what we understood about the science and based on what our chairman has helped us to understand in terms of the political questions to look at as well, including whether or not it's in the United States government or European government's interest to create a vaccine that would kill everybody. You know, is it really in their interest to have you know, African masses of African workers or other workers, you know, not able to, you know, to work, you know, is it in their interest, you know, to, 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 to do things that could potentially tank, you know, the, the U S economy, you know, or the world capitalist economy in, in general, you know, the U S government is in competition with other countries like China and Russia who are also developing their own vaccines. Would it be or even Cuba, who have developed their own vaccines. Is it in the United States interest to have a vaccine or have vaccines that are, you know, that would kill or maim people 
when it's obviously not in China or Russia or Cuba's interest to create vaccines that would do that to their people. So all these considerations, the scientific and political considerations, you know, had to be, uh, you know, had to be looked at in order to make that determination that we eventually made that we believe that African people should be vaccinated against COVID-19. It was not an easy decision to come to or, uh, or position to take out into the world initially because there was so much and there still has been so much pushback from, from African people individually, from African organizations, you know, po- some political, some religious, um, you know, who have reputation for, you know, for, you know, is some of them for working, you know, in the interests of black people. Um, and, and many people have come out against the vaccine. So it was difficult at first to consider going against the grain, but our responsibility is to make that recommendation best based on what we believe were genuinely in the interest of African people. Um, and so that's what we had to do. Oh, uh-huh. uh-huh. yeah. Thanks for that. And thanks for your leadership. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we are discussing the Omicron variant surge and a recent trip to Cuba with Dr. Aisha Fields, director of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. So, Dr. Fields, you recently led an envoy of Ahua Moving Forces to Cuba. Can you tell us the purpose of this visit? Uhuru. Yes. Um, the purpose of the visit was to be able to advance the work of our project Black Unk, our um, African Nations Emergency uh, Disaster and Preparedness uh, Organization. And what we recognized early on in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic were was the incredible um stance uh of 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 cuba uh and the incredible scientific and other kind of work not only that cuba has a history of doing but that they were doing in response to the needs of the cuban people um you know uh, uh as it related to covid-19 we knew that for example cuba was um looking at certain drugs that they had developed, uh, like, uh, interferon alpha two B I I think is the name of it. I might have mixed it up a little bit, but there was a, a medicine that, uh, Cuba had developed that, uh, seemed early on to maybe have some ability to help in the, um, treatment of COVID-19. Uh, we knew that, you know, Cuba had, um, put measures in place to attempt to safeguard the health of, of the entire Cuban population, um, that their, uh, excellent, you know, uh, free healthcare system and, and medical professionals were, were ready to respond to the needs of, um, of the people that they were going door to door, um, you know, uh, checking on, uh, you know, members of the community to see if they had Cuban, to see if they had, uh, COVID-19 symptoms. They had set up, uh, you know, uh, centers and places for people to, to recover from COVID-19. They were really responding, um, in a way that recognized the responsibility that they had to safeguard, you know, their people. And so we knew early on that there was a lot to learn from, uh, around the question of COVID-19. And as we began to develop our programs more, uh, including our COVID-19 telehealth program, which we developed, you know, uh, uh, you know, in response to the pandemic, we recognized that we wanted to learn as much as we could to try to advance uh, APDEP's healthcare work and to advance our work specifically around um around our project Black Onk. One of the things that we also uh, saw in Cuba's response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was their mobilization of what they uh, have built, um, which is called the Henry Reeve Brigades, which is a brigade of uh, medical professionals that they dispatch around the world when there are... um, you know, when there are uh, 
epidemics, when there are natural disasters. And in this case, uh, even in response to COVID-19, where they are, you know, attempting to address the needs of their own population, they didn't just go within, but they sent uh, medical professionals to various parts of the world to fight COVID-19. And this is at a time when uh, the United States government was even doubling down on the sanctions against Cuba, making it difficult for them to get things like syringes and masks and other things that would be needed in the fight against COVID-19 and where the United States government could, could not even deal with its own internal, you know, uh, uh, population as it related to COVID-19, Cuba was in a position to not only take care of their own people, but to send their medical professionals around the world. We knew we had to learn uh, from Cuba. There's a lot to learn from Cuba. And we decided to take a contingent uh, of our uh, of our uh, medical team and uh, other forces that work within our APDEP Project Black Onk to go and attempt to make relationships with um, with members of the Cuban uh, uh, government and healthcare sector so that we could begin to develop and, and deepen our own ability to develop uh, our emergency response capacity uh, under Project Black Onk. Oh, oh, thank you, Dr. H. It sounds like a lot of a lot of powerful work. Um, went on in Cuba. And I'm glad you touched on um, just the networking with different individuals and government officials out there, because I, I wanted to ask, you know, how do we um, establish connections out there? So um, w- we have f- probably for a little more than a year now been developing a relationship with an organization called the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization. And this is uh, this is an organization that has for more than 30 years been involved in incredible Cuban solidarity work. And it's also an organization that our party has had at, you know, at different times in, in uh, the history of our organization, uh, a relationship with, uh, but we, uh, have been, you know, redeveloping this relationship, uh, over the past year. Um, and they have for more than 30 years now been organizing what they call friendship mint caravans to Cuba, bringing uh, uh, U.S. citizens into Cuba uh, at different times, uh, challenging the U.S. blockade against Cuba, challenging the ability for folks in the U.S. to be able to travel to Cuba to bring supplies into the country. And for people to see the reality of Cuba, for people to have an, an opportunity to uh, to witness for themselves, you know, the tremendous gains that the Cuban Revolution has has made, and that are so distorted um, in the colonial media. And so um, we decided that it would be important to travel to develop uh, to get a, an app that contingent that could travel as a part of that. Caravan. Now, this caravan is organized by IFCO, Pastors for Peace, but for in many ways, on a real, in a really practical level, it is hosted by the Cuban um, government. So you have access to government officials, to uh, to uh, government uh, uh, institutions and ministries that you, you know are not likely to, that you're not likely to have access to, you know, um, on your own. So we felt that that was an important entry into developing relationships. And we had made, um, IFCO aware because IFCO has, um, because IFCO has, uh, they, they have the responsibility also of administering the scholarship, uh, program that, uh, the Cuban government has, established allowing U.S. citizens to come to their Latin American School of Medicine to study medicine for free. And so IFCO has also that medical scholarship program that they're responsible for administering. And it just made sense uh, uh, for APDEP to, you know, want to be able to connect with uh, Africans who are students uh, at the medical school and to make connections there. So 
Yeah. So we felt it was an important relationship and we let, you know, the, uh, if co leadership know of our intentions to, you know, to develop the ability to, to, to have training perhaps of our forces in the Cuban model of dealing with epidemics and natural disasters. And they were very open and supportive of that, of that goal. And so, yeah, that was how we made, uh, that was how we made those initial relationships. And I have to really give a deep appreciation to the leadership of IFCO, uh, Sister Gail Walker, who has been incredibly helpful in, um, in terms of helping APTEP to make connections, to uh, have access to this training that we, that we, uh, you know, uh, really want to have from the Cuban uh, government and medical sector. Uhuru, Uhuru, Dr. Fields. Now, Cuba has a long history of work in the interests of the people. The people in Cuba, as well as African and colonized people around the world. Uh, what can you say about that long history, especially in relationship to this fight against COVID-19? Uhuru, in many ways, you know, Cuba has shown what is possible when the people are determined to govern themselves, when the people are determined to um, make sure that the that they have a government that reflects the genuine interests of the people, um, that they're an example of, you know, what it means to have genuine solidarity with the oppressed, you know, uh, peoples of the world, you know, and I think there, there are so many examples of how Cuba has demonstrated this solidarity with African people and other colonized people, not, not only with their medical kind of intervention, um, you know, that they have, that they have made, for example, um, in the fight against Ebola, where they went into Sierra Leone and into, Liberia and other parts of West Africa when, you know, at a time when not only were the governments of those countries totally incapable of making any kind of real response to Ebola, but where the so-called world superpowers, you know, uh, were unwilling, you know, or unable, uh, or both to make any kind of real contribution. Cuba's, you know, stepped in setting up, you know, bringing, bringing doctors, bringing nurses, setting up clinics, putting their own lives on the line to be able to, you know, to, to be able to meet the needs of, of, uh, you know, of African people who were, you know, hit incredibly hard by a very dangerous, uh, very deadly virus such as Ebola. Um, you know, there are so many examples of, of, of Cuba, you know, intervening in terms of, you know, the, the, the health situation of African people in that way and in other ways. Also, the medical solidarity, I mean, I'm sorry, not medical, but um, military solidarity and internationalism that Cuba has shown to um, Africa, it, it, particularly in the period when you know, when there was struggle for the, you know, for the uh, removal of direct colonialism in Africa, you know, and, and, you know, those examples are, are, you know, are things that we could, you know, raise up as, you know, how Cuba has really been a friend to African people. And in this period of COVID-19, I think that, um, what we've seen is again an example of what African people have to do. Like Cuba is able to make these incredible contributions to their own population and to the world's people because they made a revolution and they put, you know, they put the the, the their resources, their their skills, um, you know, in the hands of the masses of Cuban people to it, you know, you know, to make sure that you know, that the needs, you know, of the Cuban people are met and the responsibility that we have as African people, I think is to do the same. Um, and that I think one of the things that we, I think we have to recognize too, is that Cuba does tremendous things with very little natural resources and that the wealth of Africa is so vast that when African people finally are victorious in our struggle for uh, for national liberation and for socialism, that we will be in a position to not only meet the needs of 
of African people, uh, you know, but that will be in a position to repay the the friendship that uh, that uh, friends like Cuba, countries like Cuba have given um, to to Africa historically. So just looking at like um, I know I kind of went off on a tangent, but I felt like that was important because uh, because I think what we were what we saw in Cuba was a glimpse of what a liberated Africa could look like. Um, and what we have to, you know, fight for. And I think one of the things that, that we saw is that in Cuba, because they have made incredible investments in their, uh, in their, uh, uh, health sector where they have free, uh, medical care, they have doctors in every single community. The doctors live among the members of their community. They're not separate from the community. They're not seen as people who should be, you know, paid way more than anybody else who are arrogant people somehow separate from and better than or you know than the people these arrogant forces that we see in in capitalist countries like the US or in Europe but doctors are seen as people who have an incredible responsibility to ensure the health of their population the health of their people the health of their community cuban doctors who are primary care doctors they know uh uh people with and begin to take care of them when they're when they're babies or when their mothers are pregnant with them and they and they and they see and take care of them for their you know for their whole lives they really are members of the community so when someone is ill you know you know they have they they understand the the responsibility they have to use their skills to help to make them well. And I think with the the situation around COVID-19, because Cuba has had this, you know, this incredible healthcare system, which is the best healthcare system in the world. And they have this relationship with their, with the, with their communities, with the Cuban people. There wasn't this sense of, um, of fear when, you know, when the, when the doctor said you need to come and come to this center to recover from COVID-19 or when there was recommendations that they, that people take certain treatments or that they, you know, get vaccines. Speaking of which the vaccines that the Cuban population have been given are vaccines that Cuba developed themselves. You know, we, we, we look at the fact that Cuba has developed not one, not two, um, but I, I think they've developed uh, maybe four uh, vaccines, you know, uh, to COVID-19. They've, they have, you know, they have, popu- they have uh, uh, been able to vaccinate more than 90% of their, of their population. There has been no resistance to Cuban people taking the Cuban vaccine because they don't have a history of, of distrust of their uh, medical system or of their scientists. Cuba has invested so much into their you know, uh, 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 biotech and pharmaceutical industries that they've created vaccines for various types of cancer and, and, and issues and complications related to diabetes. I mean, whatever the primary medical issues are that the Cuban people face, their healthcare and their scientific community have been, have been steadily developing solutions to that. So now with COVID-19, it was no, there was no, uh, this was just a continuation of the kind of stance and the work that Cuba has been doing all along among their population. And that is such an example for, uh, for African people. Um, and one that we will definitely take into, um, our struggle for, for the future of, uh, of African people around the world. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. And I, night with what you said, as far as, you know, this work being done in Cuba, just a glimpse of what, a liberated Africa would look like. So I really appreciate that. And and also just, I mean, just the fact that, you know, the Cuban people, I think you mentioned 90% of the people that have taken the vaccine, just the fact that they're so receptive to the vaccine, just even further emphasizes the fact how this whole thing about should we take the vaccine, should we not take a vaccine is really all about um, science in the hands of African and colonized people. I think that's what it's really emphasizing. So I really appreciate that. And I want to ask, how do you think this connection with Cuba uh, will push the work of Abdeb and Project Black Onk overall, and can we expect to maybe even see some students going to Elon for training? I think that this connection is opening the door for so many advancements in our work. I think, first of all, um, the fact that we have made relationships that 
can potentially help us to secure training um, of, you know, of APDEP uh, forces in how to respond to epidemics uh, and uh, natural disasters and other medical emergencies that might exist. Um, the fact that we have the potential to have access to that model and to that training, I think is incredible because it will position us to be able to develop um, the capacity for when there are uh, situations that constantly exist, you know, um, emergencies and disasters that exist um, in the African world that we'll have our own independent capacity as African people to respond to them. And one of the points that we made while we were in Cuba um, talking to you know, government officials and medical forces is that while we absolutely respect and appreciate what Cuba has done, particularly for African people, as it relates to responding to our healthcare needs, that African people ourselves have to have our own capacity to do that. You know, that we have to be in a position to, to do that for ourselves. And one of the immediate ways that we can see how vulnerable we are, despite having friends like Cuba, is uh, when we had Hurricane Katrina and, you know, and Africans were, you know, in need of uh, not only immediate rescue from the floodwaters, but medical treatment. And Cuba offered to send a thousand doctors into the United States and the United States government flatly rejected it. So African people have to have our own ability, despite whatever friendships we may have around the world, we have to have our own ability to respond you know, to, to situations and emergencies that Im impact, uh, our people. So we have that, uh, that as a, as a, uh, as a really important possibility moving forward to advance that capacity under Project Black Honk. Also, you know, we had the ability to meet with African students who are studying at Elam, you know, students who are, uh, you know, African students who are from the U.S., from the Caribbean, from Africa, you know, who have um, received scholarships from the Cuban government to study medicine there and to potentially recruit them into APDEP, into Project Black Ankh, you know, helping them to recognize that it is our responsibility as African people to do what the Cuban people have already done, that it's not good enough to just become a doctor and be comfortable under the neo-colonial situations in which we exist, you know, and, and to just exist as doctors. But we have to be doctors like Che Guevara, who were doctors who were, you know, who were a part of the revolutionary process, who recognized that it is important to be a doctor, but it is also important to be someone who recognizes that the primary illness that we have to confront and we have to overturn is that of colonial capitalism. And to be a part of APDEP and Project Black Aunt and to use your skills there is to advance that effort, you know? So recruiting is something that um, is, is a possibility or that has been initiated. Now that process of potentially recruiting is something that we can look at. And in terms of students, um, Attending Elam, I think one of the things that APDEP definitely wants to be a part of is a process of helping to recruit African students who, um, you know, to attend Elam. I think that is something that would be incredibly um, important for us to do, um, you know, so that we can have a pipeline of African students who who don't have to necessarily be one to that position that their skills don't belong to them, that they have to be a part of the revolutionary process on the back end, but who go into their medical school training with, with that, you know, um, mandate, you know, already having embraced that mandate. So yes, I think that an aspect of what uh, we could see and we should uh, definitely be a part of is, you know, attempting to recruit, uh, you know, um, members of our movement or the young people who are coming through our youth programs and other activities that we develop as a movement who have an interest in health or in medicine to go into the uh elam uh program if possible and to you know uh you know to to um, you know recognize that those skills then would need to come back into our movement into our struggle so i think there are lots of different ways i think there are also just incredibly important relationships overall that we've been able to initiate through this 
process of this trip that I think will help to advance not only the APTIP work, but the overall work of the Ahura movement and to win e- among even, you know, uh, uh, you know, folks in Cuba, the understanding that the African revolution is alive and that the relationship that the Cuban government and people should have, if there is a relationship to be had uh, with, with, in, uh, with Africans is one that should be on the terms of the African revolution. So all these are things that I think have begun to open up and there are possibilities that I'm excited to continue to explore and to deepen. Oh, 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 yeah. Thanks for that, Dr. Phils. Thanks for that. And salute again to your leadership in the fight against COVID-19. I'm envious of that trip to Cuba, and I really hope I could uh, make one of those trips with you. Over the last year, there have been some very exciting developments with the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. One thing that has really been a hit has been the I resistance circles. The Marcus Garvey Youth Program is back with the vengeance. And I know in the Western region of the U.S., ABDEP is looking to build a community garden and a fitness program. ABDEP has grown on the continent and elsewhere throughout the world. ABDEP never ceases to answer critical questions in the realm of African health science and medicine. You all will be presenting at the third plenary of the African People's Socialist Party 7th Congress in February 2022. We will need to have you back on the show soon to talk about all that amazing work you've been doing over the last year. So uh, thanks again for appearing on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we discussed the recent Omicron variant surge with Dr. Aisha Fields, the director of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Alikia Ngoma. Thanks to the Black Power Talk Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and a Hipster Panda. Uhuru. You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Because if you are born in America with a black face, you're born.
can pay.